bragging to Justin just a minute ago how I finally had figured out after two years the mask and microphone thing. I had a grand plan. I'd either have my, my mask on and my mic down or my mic up and my mask down and you see how that went. So not off to a good start there today, but we can also say that God has done a miracle because here you are. Uh, we just said that we'll sing wherever we go. You are here and you have been singing so so far the results are good about that. We are glad that you all are here worshiping with us today, uh, and we welcome you as we gather together. Uh, we want to know that you all are here worshiping with us, uh, and so as you came in, you got that card that says connect on it. If you could take that, fill it out, and place it in the offering basket when that comes around later in the service, we'll know that you are here. If you are new to us, uh, that's also an opportunity for you to connect with us and for us to connect with you. We'd love for you to let us know that you're out there and uh, that um, uh, whatever ways you want to learn more about the church, you can mark it there on the connect sheet and we'll have a chance to reach out to you. Um, and if you are out there watching, I know a lot of people are homebound these days. If you are uh, watching us uh, out there somewhere on the internet, you can let us know that you're here by going to fumctupelo.com and clicking where it says, I'm here, and let us know all of that same uh, info. And I, I, people actually do that, believe it or not. Those of you here, I get uh, quite a few of those every week. So let us know that you are out there. Uh, so, the miracle continues. We are looking at a few of the things that are going on in our life together as the people of God uh, here over the next uh, few weeks. One thing we want to remind you about is our, our current you know, sermon emphasis is on the work of the Holy Spirit in us, in the church, and all that's going on here. We call it Start with the Spirit. And we have been encouraging people to 
share stories of where they have seen God at work in their lives and God at work in the people of this church and in our community uh, and just in the world in general. So I'll talk a little bit more about this later, uh, but we're still wanting y'all to do that. So if you uh, are on Instagram one day, you can, you can put something out there, right, that uh, showing like where you've seen God at work in the midst of us. And just use the hashtag, uh, start with the Spirit. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later uh, in, uh, in the sermon. Uh, we also uh, want to remind you that our Wednesday nights have uh, started back. We meet right in here. We are uh, studying the Old Testament prophets. It's been a great time so far. Not By no means is it too late for y'all to come and participate and be a part of all of that. So we encourage you uh, to come on out for our Wednesday night study. We have dinner at 515, though that's flexible. Show up anytime in that window and there will be food. Uh, and then the study starts at, at 6 o'clock. Along with that, we have children's activities and youth activities. Uh, and it's just a good time, good time for everybody. Um, and uh, we also have an event coming up that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, we have a group going down to the Rainwater Observatory in French Camp um, uh, for the tele Telescopes, Trails, Trees, and Togetherness event. Uh, There's a fantastic little observatory down there at French Camp. I don't know if you know that. Uh, at, I was down there back in November, uh, and we have a crew that's going there. We're going to have several of these events through the year. Uh, uh, the Shepherds are helping organize it. I think Mary Lynn White's putting this one together. Um, and uh, it's an opportunity for us to, to see, uh, just catch a glimpse of, of God's glory, of God at work in us out there in the outdoors, in nature. And uh, so I hope you'll participate in that. It's coming up on February uh, 12th. You can see all the, all the details in your newsletter and, and bulletin and everything. Uh, and then uh, one other thing, uh, as we continue the spiritual gifts emphasis um, Imbra has mentioned this before, David's mentioned it before, but you can go to our church website right now and take a spiritual gifts inventory that may help you see some uh, things that are at work in your life that you may or may not have been aware of. So that's a little of what's going on in our life together as the church. Uh, and now we will turn to worship, uh, first with the word of prayer and then uh, hearing from the Lord in Psalm 19. Let's pray. Oh God, uh, we pray that you would perfect us in your love today. We pray that in this time we spend together worshiping you, uh, that we would see your spirit moving uh, in ways that we could not have expected and also in the ways that we have come to know and rely upon. God, be here with us today and speak to each of us uh, to draw us into faith and to deeper and deeper places of faith so that we may know uh, your grace and your love for us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Uh, we begin today with Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Cleanse me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then shall I be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. 
Let our words and our meditations and all of our hearts be acceptable today before God as we now stand and worship together. Uh, as you stand, you can look around and see who is around you. And as we begin to sing, uh, you can greet your neighbors saying, The peace of Christ be with you. Good morning, everyone. Let's worship.
stand in the presence of the Lord as we hear from the gospel of Luke uh, chapter 4 beginning with verse 14. Then Jesus filled with the power of the spirit returned to Galilee and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the prisoner go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, 
Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Uh, we hear today also from uh, 1 uh, Corinthians um, uh, chapter 12, uh, beginning with verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many, many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all made to drink of the one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, uh, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension from the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Oh God, we pray that uh, you would be at work in these scriptures that we have read to proclaim to us your good news uh, for the healing of our body and soul and to knit us together as the one people of God uh, who worship you together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to start with a question for us all today. Uh, at one, in, one, in one sense, this may be an easy question. What is the difference between a body and a spirit? What comes to mind for you? What's the difference between a body and a spirit? Now, we may think that we know or that we have some kind of idea of it. Some, some images, some impressions may come to mind. Uh, when we think of body and spirit, sometimes people think of the, the concrete versus the abstract, right? Here we are, we're all in the body. I bet many of you have a few aches and pains as we're here today. I just felt something in my back. Where did that come from, right? We are here, we can touch it, we can feel it, all bodies right here in the same space. And so body is concrete for us. Spirit is something a little more ephemeral, it's a little kind of airy, right? If you imagine what a spirit might look like, you might see something, if you can imagine it visibly, it's almost transparent, right? It's hard to kind of put our finger on because it's not, you know, the body. It's not here, hard, con uh, concrete, uh, right there in front of us. So you may think of something like that, body versus spirit. Or you may think of something like this, uh, that to, to distinguish body from spirit is to think about um, our limitations versus our imagination, right? Um, in the body, it was a 23-degree morning in Mississippi, but in my spirit, I was in 
Tahiti or whatever, right? Uh, Paul will even talk about the, this, uh, the body and the spirit this way in, in 1 Corinthians. He writes to them, though I'm absent from you in the body, I'm present in the spirit. So there's something, there's something to that image of limitation versus imagination or where we might hope to be. Uh, it, to talk about body versus spirit might um, get to our sort of our, our attitudes, our emotions. Uh, I've heard it said of a, of a wide receiver who loved to block that he had the body of a wide receiver but the spirit of a fullback, right? Uh, that that, that our, uh, perhaps in the body we're one thing, but in the spirit we have an attitude or an approach of someone else. Uh, and so that's one way that we might think about body and spirit. Um, Unfortunately, I think sometimes when people begin to think of body and spirit, they misunderstand some of the biblical language about that and begin to think of bodies as things that are bad or things to be discarded and spirit as something that's good and holy. But that's not quite right either. There are, after all, in the Bible, there are evil spirits. So it's not that spirit and body can be divided good versus bad, though sometimes we in the church start to think of it that way. And then in this question of body versus spirit, we come to the the question of the work of the church. Are we about things of the body or about things of the spirit? And could we even distinguish those things from one another? Um, Sometimes we uh, will talk about the work of the church saying that we need to go out there and and, uh, get to the real work of the church, which is caring for people who are poor and oppressed. And certainly there is much to say for that, as Jesus says, Uh, in the reading that we have from Luke 4. We might imagine that there is something uh, that we could um, cut away from our spiritual emphases and get to caring for people in our community, as I hope that we would do incredibly well, and I think as we do in things like Helping Hands and our Beds for Kids ministry and all of all those things that we have going on. But sometimes we kind of get muddled in our thinking about that, Um, and we might begin to wonder the stuff that we do as a church, uh, even the things like gathering together on Sunday morning, is that something that comes from the Spirit? Or is it just something that we do because it's what we do, right? You come to this place, we have no other way to exist, right? We, we exist in the body, so here we are, right? Was uh, the worship that we offer when we felt the Spirit moving, was that really the Spirit or was it just that fantastic key change that happened that affected us in some way. Is there a tension there? And it's something that we in the church can, can struggle with, both in our sort of outward ministry and in the things that we might even do here on a Sunday morning. Now, we might find some biblical images, I, I will grant, that could separate body from spirit. But in our passage today from Paul, writing to a church in Corinth, a church that is in the middle of deep conflict, he says something that might give us a different sort of answer to the question about how we would distinguish and talk about body and spirit. For in the spirit, says Paul, we are all baptized into one body. For in the spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Jews and Greeks, slave and free, for we were all made to drink of the one spirit. For Paul, in this passage, body and spirit go right together. And in fact, the thing that makes us a body, and the way that he's talking about here, is what the Holy Spirit is doing in us individually, and us especially in the church together. We might say to Paul, you know, that's a nice little metaphor you have there, Paul. I've heard stories about this before. And in fact, the the image that he gives of members of the body, uh, you know, potentially rebelling against each other, he didn't come up with that himself. There were Greek stories that that went, you know, kind of in that direction that he's borrowing from with this. So we might say, well, it's a nice little image, a nice little metaphor. But I think if we say that, then we will miss what Paul is really saying because he has in mind a deep reality. Yes, he's using this sort of imaginary language for it, this metaphorical language for it, but he is talking about something very real and very concrete, that the church 
really has been knit together by the work of the Holy Spirit to be the body of Christ, a reality that is far more than we might have imagined it to be. So to that metaphor we go. What does it mean for us to be the body of Christ? And I go back uh, here to the beginning of this of the reading. Uh, for just as the body is one and has many members, Paul says, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. That's how he begins. And you might expect him to say, right, uh, you all are members of the body together, and he'll get there eventually. But that's not what he says at first. This is how it goes. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with, not first us, so it is with Christ. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ." We might have expected Paul to jump to where the passage will go eventually, which is to say that we all belong to one another in some way, but he doesn't go there at first. First, he goes to the reality that we are, are that is, is actually true for us, that we are uh, grounded in, that's fundamental for us, which is that this is what the body of Christ is like and what it is for us to say that we belong to to Jesus. It's not first something about us, but something about the way that God is, who God is. God has many members, and he has invited us into that body, the body of Christ together. So it is with Christ. The image for all the rest when he'll talk about the different parts potentially rebelling against each other and then our need for one another, it, it's not just that we should be nice and work together and things like that. It's that we are... Being united to Christ in his de- oh, there, there I am uh, in his death and in his resurrection, right? We are united to Christ's body in baptism. What do we do when we take communion? We offer people bread and the cup, and we say, "This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ given for you." And what do we do with it? We don't just look at it and say, "Oh, that's, that's nice, body of Christ here for us." We eat it. Right? And it becomes a part of us. It nourishes us. Those atoms right, the, uh, of the bread and, uh, and molecules of the bread and of the wine or the juice come to be a part of our own body. Uh, we begin first with the reality of Christ and our participation in Christ's own life and his presence in us. It's not just an image of working together and being nice. It is about who we are in Jesus. One people for God, Jew and Greek, slave and free, one body of Christ. And so we can't separate the spiritual from the bodily as we might be tempted to do and as sometimes our imaginations might run. Uh, when Jesus comes to uh, Nazareth in Luke 4, what does he say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, release of the captives, recovering of sight to the blind. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him to do all of these things that matter for people in the body. We can't divorce 
body from spirit in the ways that sometimes we are tempted to do. The spirit drives everything for us. So now that we know what kind of body it is that we're dealing with, we can understand what Paul says about mem- being members of the body together and, and how, much, how much weight that has for him. So he gives us this image, right? The hand can't say to the foot, I don't have any need of you, right? Uh, we wind up needing, we need all the different parts of the body. It can't be all seeing or all hearing. We are meant to have some diversity in our gifts and our capabilities and the things that we that we bring to the body, that we bring to the table, and the way that we live together. We're not all identical with each other, and that's how God wants it. That's how God has designed it. And again here, this isn't just a, an inspiring analogy. It's a spiritual reality. Um, he, he speaks here in kind of a negative tone, right? It's not just hey, look how great the body works together when all of the parts are functioning well. He, he, he says, uh, or he, he imagines that, you know, one part of the body might rebel against another part of, of the body. Um, we sense this most, right, our need for each other when things are not going well. You may have experienced this in your own body, right? One ache or pain, especially if it's at a strategic point can cause your, in, your entire reality to be pain, right? Even in something that's relatively minor. Have you ever had a toothache that just consumed your whole being, right? It's just a tooth, and yet somehow your whole body hurts. I haven't had this problem in a while, but I used to have plantar fasciitis, right? When you get this like inflammation in your foot, and uh, and, and the ones, it's just a pain in your foot. It shouldn't be that big a deal, but it affects everything, right? It consumes you. Jessica could tell you stories of our, our house in New Jersey where I would, uh, it would flame up so bad that I'd be like wheeling myself around the house in a rolly chair, right? Um, because we have this pain. We experience this rebellion of one part of our body, and it affects everything. When one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. And that's exactly what's going on at the church uh, in Corinth. Paul is writing to this church that is in the middle of all kinds of controversy and turmoil. Sometimes we imagine the early church as everything just being uh, perfect and lovely, but that is, by the New Testament's own, uh, by, uh, own witness, absolutely not the case. Here's what's going on at this church, right? If we were to have been reading this letter straight through, we would have come across these things. All right, in 1 Corinthians 1, he says this, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you should all be in agreement and that there should be no divisions among you. You know why he's saying that? Because there's divisions among you, right? Um, That you should be united in the same mind and same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. By what what I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Right? They have all these divisions about which leader they line up with in the church. Then 1 Corinthians 3, so just two chapters later, uh, Paul says that they are like infants who have to be fed uh, milk. Right? He says, For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh, behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? So that, that division continues. Two chapters later, chapter 5, there, the, the church is divided over a case of sexual immorality. A man has taken his father's wife, and this controversy has consumed them. One chapter later, chapter 6, uh, he writes about how people are suing each other uh, and claiming to do license for whatever they want, free of judgment, because they say all things are lawful for me. Chapters 8 and 10, uh, he reports that some people are claiming superior uh, superior spiritual knowledge to others that enables them to eat food, sacrifice to idols, and giving grave offense to some other members of the church. And then, just before this, in chapter 11, he writes about how some of the people in the church, uh, most likely wealthier people in the church, are leaving others out of communion because they will rush on to the community meal and not wait for the other people who are 
uh, late to the assembly, most likely because they've been working. I'm exhausted from this church just reading about it. I'm glad we're in a lot better shape than the church in Corinth, right? Um, but of course, we are no strangers to division in the church. There are all kinds of things that we could disagree about in the church in America, in the United Methodist Church, in this particular church as well. Human beings, by the very nature of them getting together, you are going to find people in some level of disagreement or another with each other. That is who we are because we aren't, in fact, all parts of the same body. Um, I would venture to guess that every single one of you who has been involved in the church, any church, uh, for some length of time, uh, at, it, it, in some degree of involvement, has had some sort of disagreement. And I bet that most of you have seen, at some time or another, that disagreement expressed in an unproductive and unhealthy way. Am I right? Yeah, I'm right. Right? It's the nature of human beings. It's how we are. We are no strangers to this. It's the exact same thing that the church has been dealing with since the very beginning. That pain is a part of, in one sense, who we are. It's unavoidable. The reason that it's unavoidable is that we really do belong to each other, right? If we could just uh, disagree and go our separate ways from each other or have a conflict and, um, you know, you don't care about it really because you don't care about the other person. It doesn't matter to you. You move on with your day. But conflicts in the church really do matter because we have been knit together as the body of Christ, right? We actually belong to each other. And so when these things happen, uh, when there are pains in the body, just like there are pains in any of our body, it affects all of us. I'm reading, uh, or in fact, I just finished a, a novel called Jaber Crow uh, by Wendell Berry. It's one of the best books that I've ever read. It's part of a whole series of books about this uh, small town in Kentucky called Port William. Uh, and um, over this whole series of books, Barry explores the relationships between these different characters. And, and uh, Jaber Crow is from the perspective of the, the man himself, Jaber Crow, who is Port William's barber. And he tells the story of sort of the economic collapse of the farming community there uh, from the 20s to the 60s, of all of the relationships and his own unrequited love and the conflicts that are there. And it's a, it's a novel about faith and doubt and having faith again. Uh, and most of all, it's a novel about community and what it is for people to be uh, to belong to each other and to live together. And over the course of, of all of his works around this Port William community, uh, he talks about something called the Port William membership. Same kind of language that Paul uses here, that we're members of the body together. The Port William membership is quite simply everyone who lives there and all of the ways that they are tied to each other. And in a, in a short story that's, that's connected to, this, uh, to the Jaber Crow novel, same characters in it, are in it. One of them is, is named Burley Coulter. Uh, and Burley describes the Port William membership like this. The way we are, we are members of each other. All of us. Everything. The difference ain't in who is a member and who is not, but who knows it and who don't. Paul wants us to know that we belong to each other. We actually need each other and the pains in the body that we experience and all the conflicts that we might have and the, uh, and the wrongdoing that we might perpetuate against each other or simply the things of life that happen, they all affect all of us because we have been spiritually knit together by the reality of the Spirit grafting us into the body of Christ. Uh, body of Christ. And in that body, Paul says, we have been given these gifts. You heard a little bit about that last week. And here again, starting with verse 27, this is what Paul says. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then 
deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And then he goes on to that passage. You all know 1 Corinthians 13, where he talks about the greatest gift being love. What's the greater gifts? The greater gifts are the gifts that build up the body of Christ together, that aren't just for our own spiritual satisfaction, but that build up each other. What I want to encourage you to do, thinking about the gifts the Spirit has given us and the reality that we are bound together in Christ, is I want us to look to see where the Spirit is at work in the body of Christ. We can see it all around us. We've challenged y'all to uh, look for images of that and share that on Instagram or, or Facebook or wherever you want to uh, and tag that, start with the Spirit, right? Um, and, and, to, uh, and to tag the church account at FUMC Tupelo there. Uh, even if you don't do that, my challenge for you this week is that you look for where you see Christ at work in someone else. That can be a member of this church, uh, I would hope it would be a member of this church, but it doesn't have to be. It can be someone else, right? And here's the harder part of that challenge. I want you to go and tell that person where you have seen Christ at work in them. And all the more deep challenge is if you can do this for somebody that you may not see eye to eye with on this or that or the other thing. Where do you see Christ at work in your life, in the life of other people, in the life of this community? Go and proclaim it. Tell it. Say, I have seen God using you in this way. I bet that God will show you some surprising things that you couldn't have possibly expected. So, we began with the question, what's the difference between body and spirit? And we found that it is the Spirit of God that makes us a part of the body of Christ together. And so I want to end with another question. Can you see it? Can you see the Spirit of God at work in us, in your own life, and in each other? Whether or not we like it, we belong to each other. And God has given us, by the Spirit, this place, this people, to grow in faith together. Can you see it? Can you see the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God at work in your life, in each other, in this place? When you see the Spirit, you see the body of Christ. And I pray that it would be so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
united and proclaim uh, what it is that we believe as the church with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's be seated. Oh God, we pray that as we uh, abide in this place as the body of Christ, as we hear the waters that remind us that we have been uh, engrafted into the body of Christ through baptism, uh, and as we unite our voices in saying the creed and unite our voices in singing, 
that we would remember that you have called us to be one body of Christ together. Oh God, we pray that uh, in this body we would grow in our faith uh, of you, that we would grow in our love for one another, and in that faith and love proclaim to the world your grace and truth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Um, as God's forgiven and reconciled people, we now offer our gifts and ourselves to God. Um, the offering baskets will come around here in a little bit. Um, and this time we can also uh, offer ourselves to God in prayer. Uh, there are kneelers all around the room. If you would like to go and uh, pray, we encourage you to do that in this and the next song. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, I would be honored to do that. I'll be kind of hanging out in that corner over there and just grab my attention. I'd, be, I'd love to pray with you, pray for you. Um, let's continue to worship together. stand and sing this last song together.
Jesus, may you go in peace. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To, all, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, 
majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. You